Good afternoon. Welcome to the Carter Center's Forum on Human Rights and this afternoon's roundtable on Native American participation in 2020. My name is Avery Davis Roberts. I'm an Associate Director in the Center's Democracy Program. And it is my great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon and to have the opportunity to speak with the panelists about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, the enfranchisement of indigenous people in the United States. We have a really great group of knowledgeable and engaging speakers. This is gonna be a great conversation. Before I introduce the panelists and we jump into the discussion though, I wanted to take just a few minutes to tell you a little bit more about why we are here, why the Carter Center is hosting this online conversation. The center was initially established with the idea that it would in some ways replicate the environment of Camp David, that it would be a safe space in which sometimes difficult conversations could take place. Since then, the mandate and the work of the center has grown and changed. And now, 35 years later, the center focuses on public health, promoting democracy, peace, and human rights. One of the key ways the center promotes democracy and human rights is through the deployment of nonpartisan international election observers. Since 1989, we have observed over 100 elections in more than 39 countries and have accumulated quite a bit of comparative knowledge. Among those 100 plus elections that we have observed are elections from the Cherokee Nation, the Cheyenne and Arapaho Nations and the Muscogee Creek Nation, all of whom invited the center to observe their tribal elections. We deployed teams of nonpartisan international observers to those elections, recognizing the sovereignty of those nations. And it was through our efforts to observe tribal elections that we as an organization that has not traditionally worked extensively on US election issues, became aware of the challenges that many Native Americans face when participating in local, state and federal elections. As we'll hear today, these challenges are varied, they are many, and they are disenfranchising American citizens. From the center's perspective, as we were learning about this, there were a few other things from a sort of international perspective that became clear to us. First, the challenges that are facing Native American voters are sadly not unique. Indigenous populations in other countries are also geographically, educationally, linguistically, socioeconomically, or technolo technologically isolated. And we thought, that perhaps there were experiences that could be shared that would be informative in thinking about how to remove barriers to Native American participation, experiences from other countries. Second, as we were learning more about this, we thought that many of these quite severe challenges could perhaps be alleviated by fairly straightforward, practical election administration related steps if there was greater awareness of their existence. And finally, based on our international experience, we thought that perhaps uh, a conversation among the right folks from different backgrounds in that space that President and Mrs. Carter imagined could make a difference. And so in that spirit, in December 2018, the Carter Center hosted a two-day meeting in Atlanta. The meeting brought together Native American voting rights advocates, secretaries of state, uh, election administrators, and others, and was co-chaired by Secretary of State Kimberly Wyman of Washington, and then incoming Secretary of State for Michigan, Jocelyn Benson. During the meeting, the Native American Voting Rights Coalition launched and shared in detail the findings of field hearings that they conducted in 2018. And we heard from secretaries of state and election administrators and others about their experiences administering and working on election issues within Native American communities. We also had colleagues from the election commissions in Canada and Mexico share some of their experiences and their wise practices. And for those that are interested, videos of some of those sessions are still available online if you want to see what people had to say in 2018. Obviously, the world has changed greatly since 2018. It's changed a lot in the last three months. COVID-19 is continuing to sweep across the globe and it is affecting everything, including how we think about and administer elections. And as many of us are aware, among the hardest hit populations in the United States are Native American communities. This conversation today is to follow up on those discussions of 2018 and conversations we had at the uh, National Association of Secretaries of States meeting in 2019, and to think more about where we are now, uh, the challenges that remain before the 2020 election, any recommendations that we can make and amplify and advocate for uh, to promote more inclusive electoral processes this year, 
all thinking about these issues with their eyes wide open about the situation in which we find ourselves with the pandemic. Joining me this afternoon and thinking about these issues are four accomplished, thoughtful friends and colleagues who I would like to now introduce before jumping into the conversation. Joining us today is Secretary of State for Washington, Kimberly Wyman. Kim Wyman is Washington's 15th Secretary of State. She was first elected in 2012 and is only the second female Secretary of State in Washington's history. Prior to being elected to this office, Kim served as the Thurston County Elections Director for nearly a decade and was elected Thurston County Auditor from 2001 to 2013. And she's a certified elections and registration administrator and is a Washington State Certified Election Administrator. Welcome, Secretary Wyman. Also joining us is Representative Ruth Anna Buffalo, who is a citizen of the Mandan Hidatsa Narakara Nation, the MHA Nation. In 2018, she was elected to represent District 27 in the North Dakota House of Representatives. When she isn't busy doing that, she is a political healer, a community organizer, a public health professional, and an educator, and is a former chair of the North Dakota Human Rights Coalition. I should say she's also an alumna of other human rights defenders meetings at the Carter Center. Welcome, Representative Buffalo. We also have with us today, Tammy Patrick. Tammy is a senior advisor to the elections program at the Democracy Fund. She focuses there on modern elections, helping to foster a voter-centric election system and working to provide election officials across the country with the tools and knowledge they need to serve their voters. In 2013, she was selected by President Barack Obama to serve as a commissioner on the Presidential Commission on Election Administration. And prior to that, she was a federal compliance officer for Maricopa County Elections Department for 11 years. Tammy also knows more about mail-in balloting than uh, most people I know, apart maybe from Secretary Wyman. Welcome, Tammy. And last but not least, we have with us Natalie Landreth, who is an enrolled member of the Chickasaw Nation and is a senior staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund. She, there she covers a wide variety of fed, federal, elect, <clears throat> federal election law issues, federal Indian laws, including things to do with the Voting Rights Act, constitutional voter protections, tribal jurisdiction, the Indian Child Welfare Act, and subsistence hunting and fishing issues. Ms. Landreth also represents the Bering Sea Elders, a consortium of 40 coastal tribes who rely on the Bering Sea for their subsistence hunting and fishing. She also serves on the Alaska Bar Association's Elections Committee and a number of other important committees within Alaska. Welcome, Natalie. Before I turn to Natalie to kick off the conversation, I just want to note for the audience that we hope that throughout this conversation, you will participate and join in. Um, you can do so at any time by joining the live chat and submitting questions for the panelists. Don't feel like you have to wait until the end. Ask any time and we'll try and weave your questions into the conversation as we go along. In order to join the live chat though, you must be a member of the Forum on Human Rights. You can join by clicking into the chat box to the right of this video feed or by clicking on the Join the Community tab at the right, tab, right side of your browser. Um, so with that, I would like to start by asking Natalie a, a question to sort of help us set the scene. Natalie, in 2018, uh, the Native American Voting Rights Coalition and NARF conducted field hearings to collect information about Native American participation in different states. For those who are not aware of the main takeaways, would you maybe share some of those main findings and highlight some of the challenges um, that remain and how they may have been exacerbated by the pandemic? Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's morning where I am. I apologize for the fluctuating light next to me. The sun is rising here in Alaska. Um, so, um, and if you see a bear like over here, if you could let me know, that would be great because there was one there yesterday while I was also on a phone call. <laughs> But thank you uh, to the Carter Center, especially thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate and have appreciated over the years the support of the Carter Center in terms of shining a light on a lot of these issues. And today is another important example of that. It's often difficult to get voters and jurisdictions and people to focus on these issues. So one of the things that we did was have a series of field hearings and prepare a report. Um, and in 2017 and 2018, so this has been several years in the making, the Native American Rights Fund led by my colleague Jacqueline De Leon and our um, Voting Rights Council, uh, pro bono council named Dr. Jim Tucker, uh, chaired nine public hearings across the United States to better understand 
how Native Americans are systematically and culturally kept from fully exercising their right to vote. Um, and we had 125 witnesses in total from all over the United States. Mm -hmm. We were able to share the preliminary findings of that in 2018 at the Carter Center, but the report, the public facing report will be published this Thursday and available mm -hmm. in nice fancy printed form. It has already been submitted to Congress in support of a number of bills because what we found was absolutely egregious. And so we didn't wait to correct the spacing and fix our many spelling errors. We went ahead and began to use it as soon as it was in a usable form. So with that sort of overview, let me give you, um, it's almost a 200 page report with closing in on a thousand footnotes. So it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> but if you have a bunch of lawyers write a document, you're gonna have a lot of 10 point <laughs> footnotes, just so you know. So the, I'm gonna give you just the general barriers to participation that we found. One is the geographic isolation. I think a lot of jurisdiction states maybe understand, of course, that their reservations may be more rural, but may not understand the enormous distances between where they are located versus how far they have to go to register or to vote, especially if they don't have a polling place on reservations. Uh, poor and non-existent roads, physical and natural barriers, some places may look close as the crow flies, but if the roads aren't maintained, like in a lot of reservations that we saw in our hearings, it makes the trip a lot more difficult, especially in seasonal weather. Uh, travel time, limited hours to these non-government offices. A lot of times these more rural offices will have shorter hours. This is an important one, technological barriers. 90% of Indian country does not have access to Wi-Fi. They cannot easily get on their home computer, those that are able to have it, uh, and download a PDF and print a form and mail it in. A lot of times what we have seen in places like North Dakota, South Dakota, and others is people congregating at the town store simply to get on their phone to use the Wi-Fi and then they drive. Um, the educational attainment or limited English proficiency was another barrier, especially in combination with the, what we call yes, no, the ballot questions. Um, depressed socioeconomic conditions, and that impacted everything across the board, particularly because um, if you have to mail in a ballot and you don't have home delivery, you need now transportation to that post office. And there were places that we found during our hearings where almost half of the residents had no access to regular transportation. Homelessness and housing insecurity was another barrier. The number of people that what they called in the hearings were couch surfing made it difficult to figure out which address do I use on the form, which precinct am I supposed to be in? Mm. This is an important one and I'll leave this one to Tammy to discuss as the czar on these issues, the non-traditional mailing addresses on reservations have posed a barrier for registration, getting your ballot, all sorts of um, issues. And then we found a lot of strange but overt discrimination. Um, examples that I've given in the past were um, requiring uh, native voters to vote in a polling place that was a chicken coop that still had egg boxes in it. I mean, it was something designed uh, to humiliate there were other places where we found that um, voters were asked to vote inside of a sheriff station, inside of a sheriff station, pardon me, where they actually ran your plates when you parked in the parking lot, which is will deter the, even, even the strongest of person with zero previous bad experiences, but that's an unusual uh, form of intimidation. So that in a nutshell is the overview of what we found and we de uh, detail each one of these aspects and how exactly it's impacting their ability to register and cast a ballot. Thanks, Natalie. Um, Secretary Wyman, Washington State has a long experience with vote by mail at this point and has taken steps to facilitate voting among Native American nations. Could you tell us more about some of the practices that you've found successful? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's uh, It's been a long road in Washington State. We have 29 federally recognized uh, tribal nations. And, uh, and as you can imagine, I think it's easy, at least from my perspective, let me back up, that um, you think that, oh, of course we're serving 
all of them well. And, and of course, we're meeting all of their needs. And I think uh, particularly in the almost eight years I've been doing this job at this level, um, realizing that it's about communication and really getting uh, the local election officials to go and meet with tribal leadership and have conversations about what the challenges are in their community and, and on their tribal land. So um, we've made some really great progress. First and foremost, the non-traditional addresses are definitely one of the issues with the vote by mail environment. And I'm really proud to tell you that in 2019, we brought up a new voter registration system that has GPS uh, and I know there's a better term for it and I can't think of the term, but we can drop a pin for every address in our state, including those on tribal land. And so we now are able to identify all of the, the you know, data points that we need to be able to issue the right ballot to each voter. And this is particularly um, important in the bigger um, land mass tribal nations like the Yakima Nation, uh, where they, they have some very rural parts of, of their, um, their community that are tough to reach. And, uh, and we do have people that are couch surfing. So now we are able to, to identify the exact location so they're in the right precinct. And then they can use the community center, center there on, uh, on tribal land to be able to um, have the, the receipt of their ballot or get a replacement ballot. And uh, they've worked with their local county auditor. There's a drop box not only located there um, in that in that nation. And as a matter of fact, and I, I've got to look at my cheat sheet, but I want to say there's five tribal um, drop boxes on the, the Yakima Nation now that we didn't have a few years ago. And that was just sitting down and talking with tribal leaders and trying to figure out what are the barriers and how can we overcome them? And I think we've seen that across the state where um, our county election officers have gone out and talked to the leadership and it's made a big difference. So um, we now have 21 uh, drop boxes that are sited on reservation land. We have 19 drop boxes that are located within a mile of the entrance of of tribal land. So, um, and then one voting center that's actually located um, within uh, within tribal land. So I think we're, we're making progress, but it's certainly just a start and we need to continue to address the needs. Thanks, those are some really great examples of just a, sort of a very practical step that can be taken to really facilitate people's access to, to voting. Tammy, you've been working on issues related to postal voting for a long time. Um, how has your work intersected with some of the issues and concerns that Natalie has outlined? Um, and maybe are there other lessons learned um, from vote by mail practices in Washington state or other states that you think should be sort of shared and applied um, across states as we consider expanding vote by mail options for, for Native Americans and for the, the broader public at, at this year? Well, thank you so much, and thank you for the inclusion with this really um, esteemed panel. I'm 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 honored and humbled. Um, so the way I think about it, when I think about particularly vote by mail and absentee voting um, in in Indian country, is I boil it down to two real challenges. The first is the address, and then we have delivery challenges. Um, so for the address, we've been working with the Postal Service to establish a single point of contact for tribal governments to be able to support um, their identity identification of proper addresses as they go through and ascribe house numbers or street names within um, within their nations. Um, just like any other count, any other county, local, state government does, what we've seen in the past is that when tribes have gone to do that and tried to work with some of their local governments, they didn't always have the most um, collaborative relationships. And so we've established a mechanism for the tribes themselves to reach directly to the Postal Service and identifying a single point of contact to help them and bypass some of those roadblocks. So that's, you know, that's something that has been, um, is, is in the works now and is getting solidified. The Postal Service is also um, pulling together a task force from within their address management specialists to make sure that they aid in the effort um, and establishing some streamlined best practices as more traditional addresses can sometimes be ascribed um, to rural addresses that traditionally didn't have that kind of an address. Um, and that all, all the addressing ties in specifically to voter registration. And that's um, what the secretary mentioned. So we are really promoting that Washington solution of allowing members of the community to utilize tribal government offices as 
an address for registration purposes. And that solves so many problems. Um, and it also pulls into our delivery issues. Um, so we're currently in the process, we've been working with NARF and, um, and the coalition to identify all of those addresses across the country. Um, I've sent them to the United States Postal Service for them to review and identify which ones they deliver to so that we can then talk about what's the potential for establishing cluster boxes mm -hmm. at those tribal government offices where the postal carrier is already coming to provide the tribal government mail to establish cluster boxes like you would see at, at say an HOA or, or that sort of thing. Um, we also are having the, you know, the Postal Service do a review of their their PO box kind of rules and regulations to allow for the use of tribal government IDs to be able to get a PO box to review, um, you know, where there are deficiencies and the number of boxes available for voters. Um, mm -hmm. And then really, one of the last things that we've been doing is um, having a review of the rural carrier routes. Rural addressing is a challenge all across the country and it's, um, it's a problem, but it's a problem if there's um, a carrier that's going right past reservation land and delivering to you know, a private ranch on that road, um, maybe we can identify some places along that route to establish cluster boxes that'll be much closer um, to the tribal land and, and mm -hmm. be able to provide voters and, and members of the community um, the same sort of delivery service that, that many people across the country um, receive. So those are some of the practical solutions that we've been working on. Um, and I've been very thankful to say under this postmaster general and this deputy postmaster, they have certainly given us um, a, lot of, a lot of resources and time um, in, in specific consideration of, of these challenges to try and remedy them. And even some of these solutions we're hopeful we'll be able to um, get in place before November. Fantastic. That's really great news. And it's, <clears throat> it, I think that, you know, often when people think about elections generally, they don't necessarily think of all of the details that go into uh, making sure that people really can get their ballots, that they really can exercise their human rights. You know, there's, there tends to be a disconnect, I think, in public thinking between human rights, electoral rights, and the practicalities of like, where is the, the mail carrier going to go? So I think it's, it's really helpful to sort of hear those examples, just to also understand some of the challenges. Um, Ruth, I understand that, um, that the primary elections in North Dakota will take place by mail this year. Um, how has this affected the process there and the sort of the prospects for Native American participation in, in North Dakota? Yes, um, good afternoon, good morning. Um, thank you for having me in this virtual space with all of you um, to share some important information that we're working on here in the ground in North Dakota. Um, I currently serve South Fargo, um, an urban district, but I'm a citizen of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Rikara Nation, um, which is located on the western side of the state. Um, and so my family, my mom, everybody still lives within Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. Uh, but there, there still are a lot of challenges, you know, as we adapt during these COVID-19 times. Um, and the first thing is really working with uh, building trust or um, having trust within the systems within our state of North Dakota. Um, and so there is going to be an additional layer of challenge um, in this upcoming election. Um, as you mentioned, we are now moving more towards vote by mail. And so for our rural communities, for our rural tribal communities, that does pose additional challenges. Um, first, with the lack of trust within our current system. Um, and then the mailing addresses. Um, there is not um, a concerted effort across North Dakota addressing the street addresses. Um, there has been work um, as far as implementation goes for street addresses. Um, the state, the Department of Transportation has made efforts um, kind of like through a statewide tour offering non-driver's uh, non licenses um, to the tribal communities. Um, there, there is work being done. So there is progress happening. We have North Dakota Native Vote um, who is working with different key stakeholders across the state, but we, we still have a lot of work to do um, in terms of building trust, building an infrastructure to where we get to a point in time where voting really is, um, you know, a household name. You know, it's uh, something that comes becomes second nature to our communities across North Dakota, and we're not there yet. So um, we need more education, more 
uh, information out there that isn't going to confuse people. Um, as the previous speakers mentioned, you know, drop boxes um, are helpful. Um, we saw some of the challenges firsthand during the firehouse caucus that North Dakota held in March, um, where tribal communities who have, say, for example, six different counties, I'll say Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, um, there was only one location for a drop box uh, mm -hmm. within one mile, over one million, about one million acres of land, uh, which poses a problem for people who don't have rides, um, who don't have the means to drive even 27 miles away, including a lot of our elders who live out in the, out in the country, we call it, you know, in the rural, outside of Mandaree, for example. Um, so there's, there's some challenges there as far as accessibility. Um, and so we, it's really good to hear what the other ladies mentioned and how they are working to solve problems because this is a huge issue and uh, a reservation like Fort Berthold Indian Reservation with six counties needs more than one drop box. Um, and so it's progress, but we need to build on that. So yeah. thank you. No, it's good. And especially while there's still maybe a little bit of time to do so, we, we hope. Um, Kim, so Ruth sort of touched on this issue of trust um, and trust between the community and the state election officials. And in 2018 at the meeting at the center, uh, Kim, you remarked on the lack of trust among some Native American communities towards state officials. Um, as we see trust in democracy and elections decreasing around the world generally, I wonder if you've had any further thoughts that you could share on this question of trust and any sort of good practices or, or just reflections that you've had regarding how state officials can work towards building that trust again, tr building the trust back, or maybe in some cases, building it from the sort of the ground up. Well, you, and I think I mentioned this at, when I was at the Carter Center. Um, I came about this in an odd way, I guess, because I ran for statewide election in 2012 and 2016. And in 2016, my opponent at the time made this a campaign issue and every stop would, would talk about this one particular uh, tribal nation up in the farthest northwest corner of our state and how they didn't have a drop box and, and this was a problem. And she was trying to basically make it my fault. And, um, and so, you know, the campaign kind of comes and goes and that definitely put it on my radar that I needed to do a better job of doing outreach. And um, and I mentioned this not to be political, but I think we have to acknowledge the political element to this because it, it did continue. She's now the state party chair <laughs> and of the other party. And she, um, she made an accusation about a different tribal nation and a different county and how um, this particular county auditor was intentionally not citing a drop box near their their tribal land because she was trying to suppress the votes of, of, um, of, oh my goodness, hold on. I've just completely blanked. I have to cheat and look of, of the Colville, uh, tribal nation. And what was really interesting was this started playing out in the press and, uh, the auditor finally said, well, that's great. Except for one minor detail. My father is an elder in the tribe. I'm a member of this, uh, this nation. And so, it, it did open up a, a dialogue. And I think that that's my takeaway of all of this politicizing of, you know, this, this idea that we as election officials are intentionally trying to suppress a vote of Native American uh, residents in, in, you know, in Washington state, people that, that are uh, members of these 29 tribes. And so um, what I started to do in the last few years is go out and try to meet with tribal elders, tribal leadership, and uh, particularly the, the Yakima Nation. I think that that's where we have had the best success and the best examples um, because I sat down and, and found out that guess what? the tribal leaders don't trust um, state government. They don't trust people like me. They don't trust um, that we are operating in their best interest. And just having that hard conversation led to some great connections. And like I said, the, the local county auditor going and, and really sitting down and listening and not just feeling like you're trying to attack me and make me look bad, but how can I help you? How can we solve these problems? And out of that has come this, this really good example of what needs to happen. And, and I know that's going to continue across the state. And so it, it's having those conversations and acknowledging that, you know what, we don't trust you. And, and there's probably a long, good, 
long history of it and a good reason why. And so I think once you can actually put that out on the table, have the hard conversation, now we can figure out what we can do as election officials to ensure that every single person who is eligible to vote has the opportunity to register and cast a ballot. And that's ultimately what our job is. And so um, I think some of the lessons here in, in Washington are transferable across the country. And, and I'm optimistic that we can get past some of that mistrust. Thank you. Natalie, did you have any comments? I know that the report um, focused that the sort of field hearings did collect some information um, around some of these trust, trust issues. I don't know if there's things that um, that you would like to add here before we sort of change the topic a tiny bit in the conversation? Sure, and that's the, the level of trust we actually asked all of these uh, folks who were testifying and conducted a four state survey across Indian country that covered um, about 1200 people. We found a comparatively high level of trust was 21% and that was in the Southwest. But the level of trust in the government in South Dakota was 8%. And that was the lowest that we found. So these are extremely serious issues in that it means your audience just does not believe what you are telling them. Mm -hmm. And so I think what Secretary Wyman has described here is really important in two ways. And we can't lose sight of this. Uh, first of all, the jurisdictions, the tribal communities need to talk about what it is that they need rather than sort of presuming they understand, presuming mail-in voting works, presuming that everybody has access, that that discussion needs to happen with the understanding that there is a low level of trust, so it may be a higher hurdle. The second thing worth looking at, I think specific to Washington, is the drop boxes that keep being mentioned are one of the things that the Native American Rights Fund is recommending all over the place. We're recommending something called tribally designated buildings where you have a location chosen by the tribe, controlled by the tribe, so they can make sure it's open, whatever it needs to be, where people can pick up and drop off a ballot because these are usually more centrally located in communities. And so that is extraordinarily helpful also because the drop box means you don't need to pay postage. You put your ballot in an actual locked ballot box without having to find your way to the post office or get stamps for the many jurisdictions that still require you to pay. So thank you for allowing me to interject that. I thought that was really um, useful to, to hear from the Secretary of Washington. No, thank you so much for adding some of those details and the nuances. And I think those sort of getting a sense of when we talk about the levels of trust, knowing that 21% is like the high end, um, really I think helps to sort of put that in context. Um, on this issue of trust, we do have an audience uh, question. Um, what is or might be the role of young people as community activists or participants in the process of building trust and engagement? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that question. I think it's a really interesting idea of sort of how do we reach out to, to youth to help build, build this, this trust. Anyone? Everyone's nervous and being too polite. Well, I'll um, jump. Um, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, I think there's a, a number of ways, certainly on the, the campaign side, uh, you know, campaigns are always looking for volunteers and people that have a, a political, you know, interest to, to support a candidate and get involved. Um, that's exciting because those are potential candidates down the road to be in leadership positions uh, like the representative on, on this call. Um, but, uh, but beyond that, you know, one thing I would put on people's radar is, and this is across the country, COVID COVID-19 is going to have an adverse impact on our traditional seasonal election workers. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell you that Washington is a, an example of the, the country. Our average age of our seasonal workers is 70. And this is the highest risk group for COVID-19. And so I think we are going to see a real drop off in available workers, either at polling place locations or even in, in the case of a vote by mail state, people that do the processing on the back end. This is gonna be a national recruitment effort. And, um, and I'll tell you, I would love nothing more than to have young people getting involved and seeing what democracy looks like in the weeds of how you count ballots, how you make sure that people are, are given the franchise and 
have that opportunity to exercise their constitutionally protected rights. So um, that's a that's a way. And mm-hmm. most of these positions are paid. I don't think too many election officials, and I'm looking at Tammy right now to back me up on this. I think most election officials have realized that volunteers, you know, you get what you pay for sometimes. So um, these positions are paid positions, oftentimes well-paid positions. So um, I would put that out as, as an avenue. And, and I really encourage people to uh, look into that in their local election offices. And, yeah, and that actually, yeah. that's, oh, please go ahead, Tammy. Can I just add one piece to that? Yeah. So when you were reading the question, what came to mind is that a couple of years ago in Alaska, they had the um, language summit and there were a lot of young people there. And I, Natalie will correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on this, but I think they call themselves the language warriors and they're using their work in translation of election and, and voting materials as another way of being able to retain some of the language and working with elders to learn the language and part of what they're supplementing that that learning and that capturing of the and memorializing of the language in some of these places where it's unfortunately waning is using it to infuse some of the the voting materials and being able to work and assist elders in voting in their own language and so if you are um you know if you are a young person who's politically engaged and have a language skill as well you know that is something that is remarkable and um and and desperately needed in these times so we will have in-person voting um opportunities in november um, you know, we don't know quite where we'll be with the COVID um, outbreak and at that time, but there will always be in-person solutions. And all of those in-person solutions are going to need individuals to help with translations and with assisting voters. Um, so mm-hmm. that is certainly a way. Um, and most election officials as well, those that have written languages, um, will be putting together print materials and they should be asking for community review. That's a, a great way to make sure that the right language is being utilized, particularly if there are different dialects dialects um, from village to village and that sort of thing. So um, volunteering in that capacity is another another great way to be involved. So all great suggestions. And <clears throat> pardon me, one of the things that um, I was recalling about the meeting in um, 2018 was also um, this idea that having uh, poll workers who are from your community um, can really help encourage people to to turn out to vote and make them feel like it's a safe space and sort of help build that that sort of level of trust. So I think this idea of maybe having people volunteer more more often or sign up more often and be recruited, that the step needs to be taken to also recruit people from Native American communities to work in local polling stations is another good way of sort of helping engage maybe young people, um, particularly in this, this coming election cycle. Natalie or Ruth, I don't know if you have anything you want to add on that, or we can we can move on to the next question. Well, I'd want to add one thing, which is that involving the youth is incredibly important. There is such an enormous space and need for people to be involved. I understand, as Secretary Wyman said, a lot of the elections workers are older. We have found this to also be the case in Alaska and other places that we have worked. But even if you're not going to be a poll worker, you are so needed in so many ways to help register people, to help get out the vote, you know, efforts like the ones run by uh, National Congress of American Indians. You are also needed, quite frankly, you know, as if you are able to provide transportation to that drop box. Um, If you are able to not only translate for people, but a lot of elders have disabilities, including people in your family that even if they speak English, maybe they can't read that ballot. So maybe you need to read that to them. So there's a crucial role. And I think a lot of the issues that we're seeing could, you know, those holes could really be filled by an active, you know, younger um, voting generation that could help address a lot of those uh, specifically within tribes. And those are trusted messengers. So they're ideal to work on a lot of this. Very helpful. Ruth, any thoughts from your side? Yes, we do just, have, yes, please. Sure. Just echoing the previous speaker's comments, um, it is so important to amplify the voices of our youth. And we know that, for example, within the state of North Dakota, across our tribal nations, the majority population within tribal membership is the young, the younger generation, especially the especially from the 18 to 25 year old. Um, age group. And so we know that through various 
uh, forms of art, um, photography, you know, showcasing their talent can bring so much to a campaign, to a voting campaign. Um, so, and we're seeing that, we're seeing our, our youth really showcase their talent through language, song, dance, um, really being strong in our cultural values. And as Tammy mentioned, you know, it's so important to uh, modify materials for a specific community because that's how you get buy-in from a community. Um, if you see something that you can relate with, you're more likely mm -hmm. to um, to go in that direction or it's, it's more likely to grab your attention. So I think it's so important <clears throat> that we invite our youth to participate in, in any um, type of civic engagement that we can. No, thank you. Um, sort of while we're on this issue of sort of broader ways to think about participation, I wanted to ask you, Ruth, sort of more about um, your experience running for office. Obviously, when we think about participation, we usually think first about voting, but um, the other side of that is, is uh, the right to be elected. And 2018, the year you were elected, was a big year for female candidates, including Native American women. And there are a number of Native Americans running for office again um, this year. What are, what are some of the unique challenges and opportunities for Native Americans, especially Native American women, uh, who are seeking office this year and, and into the future? Well, you know, I ran um, in a statewide race in 2016 for insurance commissioner and I didn't win, but I had some small successes along the way. But what struck me most from, from that experience was the uh, level of trust that people um, instilled in me uh, to carry their stories forward. I heard a lot of comments on the campaign trail across the state at that time in 2016 that they were not heard. No, this was the first time that a candidate ever listened to them, you know, so I felt a great deal of responsibility after losing in the 2016 election and wanting to carry that work forward. Um, and aside from that, even um, I had a lot of first time voters within my immediate family. I had um, first cousins where it was their very first time um, participating um, in an election, you know, we all participate in tribal elections, but it was a challenge to get uh, peers and tribal members to participate in a state election. Um, and so that's a barrier that we're working on and that we're overcoming through having more representation in state government, um, because we know we need more representation in every level of government. And we do have um, a few women of color running for state uh, legislature here in North Dakota. And so it's a great opportunity to um, engage with voters, to give the young people an opportunity to see someone who reflects their values, who um, also may reflect their demographics and their lived experiences. And so that's important. Um, it's important to have adequate and proper representation. Um, and currently in North Dakota, we don't have that. You know, I'm the uh, only Native American woman serving in our state legislature. Um, and so we're in a deficit. You know, in 2016, there were three of us Native Americans who ran in a statewide election. And we were told that was historic. It never happened in any state across the United States ever before. But it really um, is, striking because we're still in a deficit. It's, it's nothing to celebrate, you know, it's, um, we still have a lot of work to, to do. And so we know um, that there's momentum building and, and it was great to see so many more people run in 2018 and win. And we hope to continue um, getting more people engaged and um, people who um, have been active within their communities, you know, working um, for years on certain issues that matter the most to them. And mm -hmm. so there's lots of opportunity for uh, Native American legislative women um, who are putting their names out there. Um, and we need to take advantage of the different training resources locally um, and nationally. And so I had the opportunity of interning for uh, Representative Panko V. Victor's in Kansas um, and she, they serve two year terms as opposed to North Dakota, we serve four year terms, um, but she has been in the state legislature since 2011. And she has had so many different uh, interns go through her office. And one of her other interns is 
actually running for state house um, in Kansas, representing Lawrence, Kansas. Um, so there are some exciting things happening out there, um, but um, challenges would be um, maybe being confined to a box, so to speak, because um, many of us who grew up on an Indian reservation um, and now live in urban settings um, and in a state like North Dakota that is very rural, um, it really comes down to our values. You know, what are our values and how can we um, help improve the quality of life for everybody? And so I just wanna encourage others to continue um, to stay involved, um, you know, especially civic engagement. Um, and you don't need to be an elected official to create change in your community. Um, that's something important to, to remember. Um, but my experience in, in a very red state, a trifecta known as North Dakota, um, some of the challenges I would say as a Native American legislator, um, the, the attacks are a little bit different. Um, the, the media attacks are a little bit different. Uh, you know, with uh, compared to the next state legislature. So there, there's uh, work to do in that arena, but I would say to not let that uh, deter you from pursuing um, state office or work in any level of government. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And um, your, your last point, I think really resonates with, with me and I'm sure with other colleagues at the Carter Center and, and other organizations who may be listening. And um, one of the things that we have been really trying to um, understand more fully, I would say in the last several years are sort of some of the um, barriers um, and honestly sort of the levels of, of, of violence um, that minority candidates have to face when they are running or after they're elected, um, but also the sort of the gendered ways that um, attacks against candidates may manifest. And so, um, you know, I think that that your comments really resonate. And I wonder also, and maybe Secretary Wyman, you've had similar experiences running for office, whether um, sort of your ex you, you have perceived your experience to be quite different from your male colleagues. Um, as you've as you've run for office, fulfilled your job. Um, just I was just wondering if there were if you had any reflections, um, either of you, on, on that aspect of of work. Yeah, I, I think on the gender side, certainly, um, I was the only uh, statewide executive office holder in that first term, is along with being the only Republican on the West Coast in executive office. So I tend to be that outlier and that's my lot in life. Um, but but it's it's something that I, it's subtle. There, there are the subtle things. I haven't had the, the in your face um, part of it, at least that I'm aware of. Um, I, I think that it's almost like a dismissive sort of attitude, uh, particularly I can remember going to a lot of campaign events that first time around in 2012. And it would, you know, I'm on the ballot with the governor and, and the attorney general and the higher profile offices. And so, you know, US Senate at that time, and you'd get there and they were all male candidates, of course. And um, and it would be in Republican events anyway, it would be, oh my gosh, you know, the, the, this candidate for governor and oh my gosh, this candidate for, you know, attorney general. Oh, and, and there's that woman you know, running for that one office. And and they didn't, what was interesting, especially the second time around when I'd actually been elected, it continued. Mm. Like, oh my gosh, the governor candidate's here. It's like, yeah, he's, you know, I don't want to be cocky, but he's not been elected statewide. I actually, yeah. and so I don't know if that was gender necessarily or if it's the office or what it is, but but there's certainly that, that there. And then it, you know, now, eight years in, I'm starting to finally get the respect, like it, silly things, they, they introduce you out of order, you know, mm -hmm. so you have the, you have the governor candidate and they get to go first. Well, technically I'm the highest ranking official in the room. I should get the deference because I'm secretary of state and yeah. I never press that, but they're eight years in now, they're finally getting that where I notice I'm getting, a, I'm getting introduced first. So that's within my own party. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that the politics of it get a little weird because like I said, I'm this Republican in a very blue state. 
Um, I don't necessarily think it's gender um, driven. And, and the Democrats in my state have been very smart. They always run a women against me. Uh, and so that, that kind of neutralizes the gender side a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if anything, it becomes the, you know, well, the next secretary of state will definitely be a woman. Well, thank you, Captain Obvious. You know, that, that's awesome. What does that have to do with anything related to the job? You know, mm -hmm. my gender has nothing related to how well I'm going to do the job. It should be my performance. And so, you know, I tend to try to focus on job related performance. And I happen to be a woman who's damn good at it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that you know, now I'm 57. So I've had a lot of time as an elected officer. I've, I've been elected for 20 years and um, I'm comfortable in my own skin. I'm, I, I have thicker skin now than when I first started. And I don't really focus too much on the gender piece, but it's there. It, it's going to yeah. be there for me. I guess I close on this, this, on this topic. Um, I use it to my advantage because what I found is people, particularly men underestimate me. They underestimate me. And I think that, that that would be my inside secret that I would share with, with people watching this right now is, is that whatever that thing is that people try to use against you as, you know, that you are somehow less than, you are less than because, and fill in whatever it is, because we all know those things are out there, because you're a, a woman of color, because you are Native American, because you are whatever. Um, let them do that because they will underestimate you every time and they will not think you're formidable. They will not think you can win. They will not believe that you can, can win the case in court. They will not believe you can win the election. And then you just show up and you, you know, you kick, kick butt and take names. And then all of a sudden they go, well, how, how did she win? You know, the governor candidate didn't win. The attorney general candidate didn't win. The Senate candidate didn't win, but you know, she's the one left standing. And, and I think then over time you gain respect from those actions. It's good advice. I think they're probably all, all aspects of life. I don't know, Ruth, if there's anything you would add, other advice? And then we do have another question from the audience. Um, advice for our, our, our young people. Or just, or... or just sort of reflections on any gender dynamics or, or anything else? I mean, you gave some, some good advice earlier, but I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add before we move on. Yeah, um, in North Dakota, you know, we have um, 30 women out of 141. So we're barely um, underneath 25%. Um, we're t actually 21% of representation in our state legislature. And we know that is, um, there's an imbalance there in representation when we look at the total population of in North Dakota and and women are the um, <clears throat> larger represent larger rep, uh, population in North Dakota. So there's some work to do there, um, but I would just say to, that it's so important to support one another and um, just find ways to either uh, learn more about the process because I think that's one thing that so many women from all walks of life, backgrounds, belief systems have shared with me is that um, they didn't know as much of the legislative process, the electoral process until they started following me on Facebook, you know, by all of my different live videos that I did. Um, people followed me throughout the campaign trail and they would say, I've, I've learned so much. I didn't know this is what you do or, you know, X, Y, and Z. And then once I won my race, and sharing just bits of information to the public. You know, we do have the website, but um, you know, of like date, time, hearing, but that doesn't really give you a, um, a good picture of the entire process. So I know that there's different groups out there like the North Dakota Women's Network, nonprofit organization that really focuses on bringing uh, more women into government. Um, there's the new Women's Leadership Institute that I'm an alumni of. It's a free program. It's uh, affiliated with Rutgers University, but we've had so many different women go through there. I've actively recruited people. I was actually their keynote speaker last year and then was scheduled to be a faculty in residence again this year, but it's canceled due to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there's so many opportunities out there. And I would just say to be bold, um, don't let any uh, thing deter you um, away from being involved because I think that's intentional strategy to scare people away from being engaged in this process. And once you're engaged, you find out that it's not as scary as you thought it was and it, and it needs to be more accessible to everybody. And so we really need to find ways to share this information out to everybody because once they see and learn how 
accessible and how easy certain aspects are in this process, like legislative process, electoral process, they're more likely to be engaged. And so with that, I wanna share that I had a revolving door um, last legislative session of visitors from all walks of life, not only Native American, um, not only young people, but uh, people from all ages would come and sit with me and take in a house floor session. And I would post on my Facebook, you know, reach out to me if you ever want to take in a house floor session, if you ever want to come sit on the floor with me. And people would respond and say, well, why are we sitting on the floor? Are we protesting? And so it was like <laughs> even just kind of getting um, people acclimated to the different language within the, the Capitol building, you know. Um, but really just trying to uh, bridge that gap, so to speak, of really letting people know that we work for you and this is your capital and you're, you're welcome in here, you know, so it would uh, be interesting to see if there was data collected on how many new visitors have come into the state capital um, within these past two years, because I had a lot of people come up to me who were 50 plus and older and say, this is the first time that I've ever been in my state capital, you know, and so we yeah. need to um, make sure that people know that they're welcome to come in these spaces that they have historically not felt welcomed in or were not historically welcomed in those those spaces such as our state capital. Thank you. So we, we have, we're down to our last five minutes. This has been such a great conversation. Time has gone really fast. Um, so my last question is really a question to all of you. Um, what do you see as sort of some of the lasting changes from the pandemic um, and, and the changes in how we might think about election administration, how we might think about inclusion of Native American communities going forward and um, related to that, are there ways that we could uh, maybe think about some best practices and how we could um, weave those into uh, networks, tribal networks or other associations so that it's really sort of getting down to community level programming. I don't know, we only have a few minutes, so maybe just some quick thoughts in a round robin. I don't know who would like to go first. I'll go first if you don't mind. I think one of the lasting changes is that we are going to see expanded use of mail-in voting all over the place, which is a great development for people that have that kind of access, but we don't have that on uh, a lot of reservations, the lack of addresses, the distant post offices, the not enough post office boxes, and the inability to get to them a lot of times means that we can't presume that that is a uniform solution that fits all. Um, so I hope the lasting effect of expanding the franchise for people that have that access also means that on the other side, we have a lasting sense that accommodations need to be made for a lot of rural native communities along the lines of what Secretary Wyman was describing here, which are tribally located places where you can pick up and drop off a ballot, hopefully register, so that this in general is more accessible to native communities. I would just jump in real quickly and say, um, absolutely. What my hope is, is that we'll see the expansion of options, both in registering to vote, as well as participating and requesting of ballots um, and returning of ballots, that we'll continue to see those expansions of options for voters um, after 2020. Fantastic. Other reflections, Ruth or, or Kim? Sure, um, I can go. Um, yeah, I think just the the COVID-19 has really exposed uh, a lot of our shortcomings. And so that provides an opportunity to do better. Um, and so, you know, across the board, our infrastructure has been exposed, you know, and lack thereof. For example, a sound, robust pu public health infrastructure, um, which should go hand in hand with voting. And so, um, things that, that the previous speakers mentioned as far as broadband, um, accessibility, um, those are areas that we need to work on um, to make sure that voting is um, accept as accessible to the next person um, as it is within our tribal communities, especially. Um, so I would really say, uh, you know, in North Dakota, we don't have voter registration, but we have the, the challenge of street addresses and uh, even having uh, proper training at the polls for workers to understand that a tribal ID is still a valid document. Um, so there's progress being made, but there's so much more room for improvement. So thank you. Thank you. And, and last thoughts to you, Kim. 
Uh, yes, I, you know, I think I, I've been talking about vote by mail now for about 75 days, more than I ever <laughs> thought I would. And Tammy could attest to the fact that I am probably the biggest champion of it. But I'm also the first one to say that it is not the end all be all solution for every voter in this country, nor in every voting uh, jurisdiction in this country. And I think that um, what we're seeing is a, a a robust discussion about the merits of vote by mail, and I'm not sure this year we have the time for it. Um, we have a we have a big problem in front of us. You know, we have a lot of people that cannot go into a polling center, and we have to figure out how we're going to make sure that they can vote. Um, and those that do go into a polling center have a safe voting experience and working experience. So we need to tackle those problems. But I'm hoping out of all of this, when we get to 2021 and the dust settles, that we can actually have a robust conversation about the fact that you know you look over the last 60 years, we have massively expanded the number of people who are eligible to vote um, between the Voting Rights Act and just, just greater awareness and technology. So now we're operating on a model that was created 100 years ago. <laughs> Go to your local polling place with your neighbors and vote. It doesn't work in the modern era. And I think that's what we have to have the conversation about is what does voting look like in the 21st century for every community, not just that you know, traditional dad goes to work and votes on his way to work and mom stays home with the kids and she votes when they're at school. We have to expand that conversation to the modern era and find out the places where we're not meeting the needs of the communities and meet them. I'm optimistic we can do that. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Well, thank you all so much for a really fruitful and interesting discussion. It's been so great to see your faces after being at home for so long, it's like, oh, human contact, it's wonderful. Um, we do plan to continue this discussion on a thread in the Human Rights Forum um, and hope that our audience will join us um, as we try and sort of think about these issues more and maybe offer some solutions and start imagining this, this future that you've invited us to, Secretary Wyman. So to our audience, thank you for joining us. Please do join us for future roundtables at the Forum for Human Rights. You can find out more information about future roundtables at forum.cartercenter.org. We look forward to seeing you there and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you.